So welcome to this edition of Indiana Flora News, and I'm your host, Paul Rothrock. <laughs> In the news tonight, the plant photographic scavenger hunt is moving into phase two. Also in the news, Consortium of Midwestern Herbaria, exciting updates. And finally, a special report on the Charles Dean retrospective and filling the gaps. So those are the top news items for tonight. So anyway, in more seriousness, photographic scavenge hunt is the first item of business. And um, um, we started this uh, last winter and we're actually able to get some funding, including from the uh, Indiana Native Plant Society to make this happen. Um, you may recall that on the Consortium of Midwest Herbaria website, we have a series of species pages that can look like this. Here's our state tree, Liriodendron tulipifera, complete with uh, primary photos and secondary photos that beautifully illustrate the diagnostic features of this particular plant species. In addition to these uh, lovely photos, we have information about the flora of Indiana from Charles Deem, as well as some additional materials that I'm trying to add, and other tabs that would have the flora North America information, or the Gleason and Cronquist descriptions, and so on. And down here in the corner, you might notice there's a icon that says open interactive map. So you can not only see the pictures, you can map them out and see where these species occur. Now we have about, if I rough it in, about 2,800 species in Indiana, but only about half of those, as we started the, uh, the photographic scavenger hunt, only about half of those had good photos. And so here's an example of a species that at the time we began the project only had, <clears throat> only had uh, images of dead flat plants in essence, herbarium specimens. Uh, we have since received several photos of Acheronthes uh, japonica, so it's not so desolate anymore, but we still could use additional good photos. <clears throat> in case you haven't already visited the, uh, the web page that we've set up for the project, um, you can um, either Google IU Herbarium and you'll find the herbarium page and the link. Or if you have this web address, herbarium.bio.indiana.edu, that'll take you directly to the web, website for the scavenger hunt project. One of the main things you'll want to find on this website would be the hunt lists. And we have those, um, uh, established for each of the eco-regions in Indiana. So if you happen to be here in Monroe County, you can find the hunt lists for the Highland Rim and Shawnee Hills eco-region. Um, or if you happen to be up near um, uh, West Lafayette, you might wanna look in the Entrenched Valley eco-region and find that hunt list. And we're, we're updating these through the summer to uh, remove those that are past flower and maybe even past fruit, and bring in those species that are coming into flower and fruit. But in addition to the, um, the hunting lists, I do want to reinforce the idea that if you have a favorite site that you continuously visit and you see interesting plants that you want to document from that site, we can set those up as observations, observation occurrences as was done for this um, uh, turtle head, Kiloni obliqua, which I uh, visited last summer. Uh, we did a bio blitz at Southwestern Park in Marion County, and I set it up. Here's a picture of the plant with the records of where it occurs and when I observed it, and then it's documented with a quality photograph. There it is. Now, <clears throat> whether you have observation points that you want us to add to the website, or again, images that go with our hunt list, uh, you then can 
upload those from our website. Um, you give us your name, your email, and you can then find the files from your computer. Uh, uh, we, we ask that you um, uh, zip them if you have quite a few that will allow you to put more pictures in at the same time. But all, anyway, all the instructions for this kind of work, they're on the website. And I'm just kind of trying to review for you some of the, some of the basics of what's there. All right, so how we've done so far. Um, well, we've, we've had, a, I think, two dozen active participants in the scavenger hunt. Uh, we have processed uh, over 2,300 photographs. So, uh, several people have had some libraries of photos that have up to those numbers. But at any rate, we have a, uh, quite, a, quite a large number of additional uh, photographs that have been added. There have been uh, about 100 species that uh, we really have uh, satisfied the needs. And, um, and we've added then you know, over 100 um, observation records beyond that. Here's an example of uh, one of the web pages, species pages, that has benefited greatly from submitted photographs. Um, Dicentra canadensis, even though it's a beautiful and fairly frequent member of our flora, it only had uh, rather poor quality photos before the project began. And we now have um, uh, photographs from Colin Hobbs and from Bill Thomas and Bob Easter and Rich Hall, uh, and including this lovely one that shows the, um, the corms. So we'd like to see parts of the plant besides flowers, you know, make sure we have good images of foliage and if they're interesting underground parts, they have those as well. And then just to show a few of the images that have come in recently, I asked uh, Jillian for um, her Clematis bior biorna vase vine. And she kindly submitted that. I asked David for his Asclepius exaltata, the poke milkweed, and he sent several. And they're indeed lovely and added to the uh, website. Uh, Mark Sheehan, is, who's in our chapter, uh, sent in some nice ones of the white bergamot. And we have Hydrophyllum canadensis, uh, the blunt leaf, blunt leaf water leaf has been added. And see, that's a you know, spectacular image. So we're very pleased to get these added to the, uh, to the website. Now, needs. More participants. So if you're in this uh, session tonight, hopefully this is encouraging you to take a look at the website and um, think about finding things that are on the hunt list. We're gonna put out a new one pretty soon for August. And uh, consider again, making observation photos, even if something that's not on the hunt list, but that you have some particular interest in a uh, species or an area and you want to document that you know, please submit those as well. I would make some comments about image quality. Um, on our website for the project, we do have some hints about how to take uh, uh, good photographs, but um, I, would, I would observe three basic problems that seem to be most common and not unexpected, focus, you know, things have to be sharply in focus. So take lots of images and figure out how to, how to work your autofocus so that it gets the right part in sharp image, sharp focus. Um, I actually do a lot of manual things with my camera, but I, I know lots of you have autofocus and auto exposures and have to figure out how to adjust them and play with them to get them to cooperate. So that's the other thing, exposures, um, especially if you have white flowers, you need to slightly underexpose the image. Uh, I'll get images that are beautifully exposed except for the flower, which is burned out. And that's, unfortunately, we can't, we can't use it. So think about both focus and exposure. But the third thing I would uh, have you think about is just removing some of the extraneous matter around the image. So the example that I have here is one of mine in which I was actually able to 
uh, get the flower and the fruit, and even in the background, another flower kind of in, in blurred image. But notice it doesn't have a lot of extraneous things that, you know, a leaf of a, of a blade of grass goes right across the middle or something like that. So just, just even some very basic clearing away of the area right around where you're wanting to photograph. So you don't have too much extraneous stuff going across in front. Okay, time for a message from our sponsor. Yes, and we have um, remind you that up, coming up this November is the annual meeting and it's going to be held in Carmel, Indiana this year. So mark your calendars, November the 13th, 2021. We're gonna have a live conference, I'm told. So um, get that on your calendar right now. Before we go forward, any questions from uh, you, you folks out there? Um, you, you didn't mention seeds. Are people ever submitting uh, what the seeds look like? Uh, when you say um, about parts? Uh, if, well, we're really interested in the diagnostic features. So yes, if the seed is a diagnostic feature and it would be in something like, well, maybe it's more the fruits. You have one seeded fruits that almost look like seeds. And, and certainly, um, uh, you know, many, many of the uh, sedge things, yeah, you have okay. to have the fruits. Um, All righty. But yeah, fruits, I would guess I would say more than seeds. Yeah. But there are some, hmm, I'm trying to think if there are examples. Okay. Where okay. seed is, where truly the seed is what you're looking for. I can't think of some right offhand. Right. Okay. But usually the 18 fruits, the one seeded fruits, they can be highly diagnostic and we do look for those. How okay. about corn salad? That's, again, that'd be, that'd be the fruit though. Okay. Yeah, it really is a one seeded fruit. All right, let's move on to the second right, part thanks. of the news, the news, which is um, the Consortium of Midwest Herbaria updates. And um, so there is the web address for, for the, uh, uh, the data portal that I worked on as we digitized the herbarium. Um, so anyway, some updates on what's happening with the, the website that is being populated with these photographs, midwesterberia.org website. And so earlier we showed this one for the, uh, the tulip tree and commented this is, you know, information rich. But you can also do uh, data searches. You can search the database and see what specimens are in the uh, in herbaria around the state, but especially the IU herbarium. And on that, uh, um, to do that kind of a search, you would go to specimen search. And I would suggest actually specifically selecting the IU collection. And then you need to put in here either uh, the scientific name, which if it's tulip poplar, it's liriodendron. But if you know the common name, you could also change that heading right here to common name and start typing in tulip. And well, there's tulip tree. And so you could find it that way as well. Uh, by the way, besides searching on a name, you could also search on the state and county. You could even uh, search on state and then put in a locality like uh, bean blossom and see what comes up. Or you could collect, you could uh, uh, search on a collector's name. Maybe you only want to see what specimen, specimens Deem has collected. So there are lots of ways that you can query the database that we've created. Uh, following through with this one on the Liriodendron tulipifera, for the tulip tree, here are the records that we have for that uh, species. And you can um, click on the full record details to see all the information about that specific herbarium specimen. You could, of course, click on the species name and go to the species page and, and see what it has to say. Um, back up one. Up here at the top, it's kind of hidden by some of the controls mechanisms. But over on the right is a tab that says maps. And so here is the map for the specimens for tulip tree in Indiana. 
And you can see that it's most common in the southern half of the state. It does occur in the northeastern quarter and the northern edge, but actually seems to be basically lacking here in much of the northwestern quarter of Indiana. So it's, it's kind of uh, regionally um, concentrated. Okay, that's what we've had. Now I have two spotlights that I wanted to bring to your attention. And the first is that of checklists. Uh, so on our Midwest Herbarium website, if you go to projects and click on Indiana, you can get these checklists that uh, I have created and posted. And these include the ecoregion based lists. So if you want to see what species occur in the general area of Bloomington and beyond, you can go to that ecoregion of Highland Rim and Shawnee Hills. These kinds of species lists are really helpful if you're trying to narrow down what you're identifying. You might be working say with oaks and you have a, a book that has you know, like eight oak species, but if you go to our ecoregion, you may find out that only three of those occur in your ecoregion. And right away that helps you to narrow down the answer. Now, last year when we were all um, sequestered because of the pandemic, my, I tried to spend some time out of doors uh, in isolation, going to some of the Sycamore Land Trust properties. And I was able to uh, spend enough time at six of them that I feel as if we have fairly complete checklists of the vascular plant species in, in those six. So the peninsula, bean blossom bottoms, canyon forest, uh, Powell, Scarlet Oak, and Trevlack Bluff. Uh, I was able to get them to those multiple times and I think have rather complete checklists. Uh, by the way, before we leave this page, I do want you to notice these icons the golden key because they're gonna have a role in just a moment. So if you click on say the Trevlack checklist, um, it has um, the scientific names, common names. You can determine how you want things to be displayed, however. Right now they're alphabetized by genus. You could alphabetize them by family but you also have an option of seeing the images. And so um, uh, here are images from the, uh, each of the species that I've identified as occurring at Trevlack Bluff. And there were 352 species on that checklist. All right, now, the other item that we've updated since uh, last I've shown you anything about midwesterbarium.org is the golden key. <clears throat> so if we take that Trevlack checklist in the upper, some of it's being blocked by the um, navigation tool, so I can't see it, but in the upper edge, there is an icon that is the golden key. And when you click on it, it opens it up and shows in the right-hand column some simple characteristics of plants. And in the left-hand column, the candidate species from that checklist. So we're starting out with 351 species in Trevlack Bluff. If I click a few of the characters at right, oh, here's this, by the way, here's the plant that I want us to identify. It has uh, compound leaves with kind of these funky veins. Notice the veins come up here into the notch rather than to the directly to the tooth. So as these kind of funky veins, it's a pinnately or a compound leaf. And it has a umbel inflorescence. You can see the flowers are white. And the arrow is trying to indicate that there are no bracts or leafy structures here at the base of this umbel inflorescence. So let's see if we can identify it. And I started by clicking off, well, it's an herbaceous plant and it has all the characteristics of being a dicot, which I, happen, I, I think many of us know how to tell a dicot versus a monocot. 
So I clicked that one and that automatically took us from 351 species down to 171 species. If I now click off that it is um, some or all the leaves are fully compound, that reduces it further. We're now down to 40 species. If I add that it has white flowers, now we're down to 22 species. So we started with 300 and some, and we're all the way down to just 22 candidates for what that particular plant was at Trevlak Bluff. At this point, I can now, uh, let's go ahead and engage the new feature. And that is, if you click on this display images function, we're now able to do, ah, here's, here are the candidate species in full color. And if we look at them, well, there are some things that are in the carrot family. There seem to be some things here that are the mustard family. And if I scroll down, there are some things that are in the buttercup and the rose family. So let's click off one more trait. And that is to say that we have flowers that have five petals and are radially symmetrical, meaning they're, they have a wheel shape instead of a, um, a bilateral symmetry. At that point, we are down to nine species. The three that you see here, white avens, spring avens, tall thimbleweed, whoops, and these six, the spreading chervil, spotted water hemlock, Canadian hornwort, queen anne's lace, sweet sicily, and black snake root. And I bet you can tell which species that we were trying to identify. It certainly is not these two because the inflorescences are all wrong. It's not that one as well because the inflorescence is all wrong, nor that one over here, the chervil. It has to either be the spotted water hemlock or the Queen Anne's lace, but you'll notice the Queen Anne's lace has these frilly bracts and they were lacking. So that plant is spotted water hemlock a highly poisonous member of our flora, I do not recommend that you ingest it. If you do ingest it, uh, get to a hospital right away or you'll die. Okay, time for another message from our sponsor, the IMPS. There is an annual photo photos competition that started. Uh, so in addition to being part of our scavenger hunt, if you have some outstanding photos, you can go ahead and submit those and see if you can win um, the photographic competition this year. And so that information is on the um, uh, IMPS website and the deadline for your submissions is the end of August. So get those in. That brings us to the third uh, news item. And I uh, wanted to first do a little bit of a, just a couple of slides that are a retrospective about Charles Dean. Uh, <clears throat> this is the 81st year uh, anniversary of his floor of Indiana. Uh, I'd hoped that we were able to, we would have been able to celebrate him last year on the 80th anniversary, but we had to wait a year because of the pandemic. Um, but you, you may be aware that um, Deem spent the period from about 1905 to 1940 actively collecting uh, plants across the state of Indiana as the basis of his 1940 publication, The Flora of Indiana. He actually collected some 50,000 specimens to support the maps and information that was in this, this volume. It was, it was really um, pioneering work, pioneering in terms of the uh, uh, scale of what he did, but also pioneering because of the conditions under which he had to uh, accomplish this feat you think back to that period of 1905 to maybe the mid 1920s, um, well, before 1920, Indiana did not have numbered highways. Uh, before 1916, there was no federal funding for highways. Before 1926, we did not have modern US highways. 
Here's a map from 1903 of Delaware County, which is where Muncie is located. And what it should impress you is that all you have are these county roads, except for these strange long straight lines that come in. And those are not roads for cars. Those are track beds. Those are rail rails. Those are trains and interurban railway. So either you, you went by train or horse and buggy or some other muscular means of transportation. And those meant you had to follow all these local roads. There was very little in the way of, of actual straight roads that went any place in particular. So Deem's strategy in collecting uh, is exemplified by looking at his records from Delaware County. He did not go everywhere. He went to all the counties, but when he visited any one county, he spent his time somewhere proximal to the waterways. So this is the Mississinua River here. And you can see he was either within about a mile or actually at or within a mile of that waterway. There are just a few scattered collections out here in the no man's land. And then these are the White River corridor. And then he also had a few over here with some other um, uh, local stream that he could, he could visit. This is before that reservoir was constructed. So I think his strategy was to find these look, what looked like on a map interesting collecting areas and he would drive between them and watch the roads as he drove between them, but he focused his attention on these areas near to uh, stream corridors. So not surprising then if, that on that local level, there was a focus, but also at the state level, there was a focus. So the ones in blue, the counties in blue, are ones where we have uh, over a thousand specimens by Dean. And notice that they are in the northern edge of the state and along the Ohio Valley. The white is the next category, 400 to about a thousand. And again, most of the time you're thinking about the northern quarter and the southern quarter of Indiana. So he spent most of his time collecting those 50,000 specimens in those regions of the state. Interesting then, you have these other areas in red and, and kind of gold that, that in, in some of them red, we have fewer than 200 specimens. So in other words, he barely visited those counties. Now, when we started the digitization, uh, if you were to look at how many in our local area, I guess is now just focusing in on our uh, South Central Indiana region. This is the number of species that we had reports of from some of the counties around us. Here's Monroe County, which you can see was the, the highest. And that was because not only of Dean, but because of student collections and, and, and others from the university. Uh, Dean spent a lot of time in Harrison County, so that had a large number. Uh, <clears throat> But then we have counties such as, well, even Brown County, we only had 464 specimens or species from Brown County, when we should have had somewhere, you know, in the 700 range, certainly 600 range, but only 400. And out here in poor Bartholomew County, they only have 276 species recorded. So clearly, we do not have a very fine grained view of the South Central Indiana flora. It's, it's, uh, it hasn't been heavily collected beyond what Deem has done back uh, 80 years ago. So in that interval and since we got deeply involved in the digitization and today, here are the number of species that we have added to some of those counties. So these are, additions in the last five years, using the digitization as a guide as to where to spend uh, some of our attention. You might notice now that Brown County has an additional 255 species. And there's a fellow who is among us who is largely to blame for that. That's David. <laughs> and I also added to that when I did the Trevlack Bluff. But between the two of us, we added 255. Up here in um, Morgan County, that's David. And out here in Owen County, that's uh, 
uh, I did a lot and David did a lot there. And then here in Greene County, that's from uh, Canyon uh, Preserve. And that's collections that I made. More recently, I've been spending some time over in Bartholomew County and Orange County, and we've been able to add well over 100 new species to those counties. So getting the sense of what is, you know, finally what is in some of these areas of the state, if we're going to understand the flora and how it's changing, we need to at least have a benchmark where we've got a sense of what is there at some point in time. Now, <clears throat> Even Monroe County with our over 900 and some species still has surprises. This last month, Nick Garza said, I found Carex decomposita. And I didn't distrust his, his identification, but I was really wondering where, because it takes a, a sinkhole swamp. Uh, this particular sedge grows on wet stumps habitat, wet stumps. So where, is, where do you find wet stumps? In a sinkhole swamp habitat is one place to find them. And lo and behold, he took us to this um, sinkhole swamp, or a sinkhole in the western edge of the county, and we could see there were easily uh, 15 nice huge clumps of this rare species. So before that, here was the distribution as we knew it in Indiana, some up here in the northeastern part of the state, and now we have a little string that, that goes from, what was that, uh, Owen County down through to Harrison County. And there's Monroe, we've added to Monroe County. The other thing that is happening now that we've had the collection digitized, so the other big news is that we have a, a, a graduate student, a PhD student, who is, is going to take advantage of the history of, of um, botanical information that we have in the state. We have two forms of historical information. We do have from the 1820s, the surveyor notes, which tell us something about at least the trees that grew in each of the, uh, the sections around the state. So that'd be very coarse grain, but we do get some image of the forest composition plus there are just some descriptive notes that the surveyors made as to how, what the quality of the vegetation was uh, mile square by mile square as they did their surveying. Uh, then we have a century ago, we had the collections of Charles Dean and the Southwestern part of the state is an area he collected pretty heavily in. Uh, so we have um, uh, records that are historical from that period of time, and then some that have been added ever since. So what Richard uh, has noticed is that the number of active collection-based floristic studies have greatly declined. And this is in spite of there being this wealth of information that's now available in digitized collections. And also there's a tendency and this is, um, this is a blind spot in the scientific community at large. There's a tendency to think that vascular plant distributions are predetermined and static. So we have these historical records and that's the way everything has been and it's always going to be. But not so, we have so many things that are changing the vegetation because of invasive species, uh, land fragmentation of habitat by human activity and certainly climate change. These are all big factors that are, that are dramatically altering the look of Indiana. I just have you try to visualize for a moment. It was only a century ago that Charles Dean was driving around in a, in a model, Ford, um, model A Ford weed wagon on back county roads, trying to document even what species occurred in the state, no highways. And today, you can hardly find a square mile that isn't highly fragmented and, and just destroyed in some way or another because of human activity. So the state has been totally transformed in a century. And you wonder, where will it be a century from now? And so what Rich is doing is he's trying to give us that perspective of how it's changed in the last century and giving us a baseline for understanding the changes going forward 
as we deal with these anthropogenic forces that are dramatically altering the um, Indiana landscape. So his, his study area is going to be from Tippecanoe County down to Posey County. He's uh, identified 50 collection sites. These are areas that Charles Deem has visited in the past. Uh, and Rich is going to uh, intensively collect, uh, revisit these sites and uh, tr try to give a snapshot of how these areas are changing in the last century. The other thing he's also finding right away is that there are a number of interesting plant species. And so, you know, I think all of us love to see pretty pictures of plants. And so let me show you a few to kind of get to the end of our presentation. These are some of the more rare species that Rich has been running into. And as we look at these individual species, I wanna show you their distribution and then have us just think about for a moment, what might their future be? Will it become more common, more co less common? Or maybe we just can't tell because of so much other um, uh, activity that's going on in the landscape. So, um, Kerrick Socialis was uh, one of the sedges he found uh, down here in Posey County. So we have three known sites for it in the southwestern corner of the state. And then just a few scattered locations along the Ohio Valley to, from the western part of Indiana to one outlier here in the eastern part of Indiana. So I don't know, will we get more, it's a bottomland species. Will this Ohio Valley bottomland uh, become more conducive for this plant as it warms or might it migrate up the, the Wabash Valley or is it just too much fragmentation for it to move? Uh, Clematis pitcheri is another rare plant from the southwestern part of the state. And it turns out that we are just at the extreme eastern edge of its distribution. Maybe this one will just become more common because our, our climate either is going to become more like that of Missouri and Oklahoma, according to climate models, or it's going to become more like that of Virginia. The main difference being how much rainfall will we have? How much moisture will we receive? So if we get a drier condition, we become more like Oklahoma. If it gets to be more moist, we become more like Virginia. And we're not sure yet which direction we are going to go. Uh, climbing milk vine is another uh, rather glamorous species that Rich is finding in that, uh, in that southwestern part of the state that's fairly rare. It's, it's in the, the dogbane family. And here is its distribution. You can see it really does just go along the Ohio Valley in our part of, um, our part of the country. And just barely up into the Wabash Valley. Uh, crow poison, he was very uh, surprised to run into this one. It was a new species from his, uh, his experience. And again, it seems to be largely something of the south central and southeastern US. So perhaps that can more generally move northward in Indiana if, if conditions uh, allow that plant to move, if we don't have such fragmented landscapes that there's no place for these to hop, skip and jump northward. Rich was really uh, pleased to find another population of Spigelia, the, the woodland pink root. It's only known from Posey County here in Indiana. Um, with three now, now three populations uh, being known for the state. And you can see it just barely nudges into our, our southwest corner. It has made its way up the Mississippi Valley just to that point and no further. Now here's one that I think we could really see uh, declining in Indiana for sure. Uh, notice that we are an outlier already for Canadian hem Canada hemlock. It is largely an Appalachian species. It, it uh, typically is in um, um, moisture cove forests, those bowl forests in the Appalachians. And here in Indiana, it tends to be on the north facing slopes that are cooler and, and kept more uniformly humid uh, by that exposure. But as we have um, 
further warming of the climate, potentially that species would decline. And that's one that is in Rich's um, uh, study plots. So there you have it. There's some of the, the, the news from, uh, of the Indiana flora. We've shown you something about the photographic scavenger hunt, um, something about how our midwesterberia.org website is changing with new improvements. And then um, um, some things about um, how we're trying to fill the gaps and build on, stand on the shoulders of Charles Dean and understand how the Indiana flora is changing as we move into the future. So with that, I'm open for other questions or comments from everyone that's joined us this evening. Oh, and by the way, there, there is the, the um, scavenger hunt website, herbarium.bio.indiana.edu. Let's see. Oh yes, is it true that Dean was so scared of rattlesnakes he, he, he would not collect where he thought there was habitat? Uh, he, he certainly did not like, he did not like uh, snakes. That is certainly true. Uh, but he, uh, he was wicked though with his, uh, his, corn, his corn husker knife. So, uh, but no, I think there's some truth to that. He would avoid places where he thought they'd occur. So he didn't visit every township in Indiana? You know, he made that, <laughs> he made that claim, but um, I can verify that he did not. Okay. It seems like it would be a very difficult thing to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at best, uh, I'm sure there were times when he was kind of coasting at 20 miles an hour down those roads and just watching on both sides of the road because um, nobody else was around. And I always have wondered how many flat tires he had to uh, <laughs> yeah. repair uh -huh. over those years. Um, but no, that, that was an exaggeration that he visited every township. He did visit every county. And the one that um, uh, some thought he didn't visit the northwestern corner heavily, but he did. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that was shown on that uh, statewide map. Well, while you're thinking, if there's another question before we uh, leave, we, um, let's have a reminder from David about this, um, this Saturday. I'm going to be doing a pop-up hike at Flatwoods Park which is in Monroe County as a Monroe County Park to see the fringeless purple orchid. We will see quite a few other things. <clears throat> Everybody's invited. Uh, Monday when I was there, a lot of the trails were covered in water. So either wear waterproof shoes or something you don't mind getting muddy and wet. Um, when does the fringeless purple orchid change over to fringed purple orchid in Indiana? I believe the fringe over is in the northern part of the state. But is there a? No, I don't line. know. I, we need to we need to go to midwesterberia.org and query uh, that. Okay. <laughs> I will. Uh, I will do that and send it to Carolyn to share. Great. Okay. Going back to the um, collections, uh, just as an example of, of tulip tree. Yes. And and the big gaps. Uh, you think in part that may be for something that's a pretty common and widespread species. People just don't bother to collect, and and there really aren't that many people even collecting anymore. Yeah. Um, in that case, I I really think it's real. Uh, in, in part because in Charles Deem's description of the species uh, in the Indiana flora, he, he, he claims that it is rare or lacking in that, that area. Oh, okay. So I think that he's, you know, he's basing that probably on his having at least driven through those, those portions of the state. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but your point is well taken because um, um, uh, when I started trying to get some more records for say Brown County, even something like White oak and been collected for white for, for Brown County. However, when that's why we did those eco region checklists because it may not have had it for Brown County, but we did have it for some of the surrounding counties, and that helps to smooth out 
that yeah. issue. And, and there's so many counties in that that sector of the state where we have no collections that I have to think that's real. Okay. In my personal observation, collecting in Brown, Morgan, and Owen counties, uh, it's just a lot of it is not been collected. Uh, Monroe's got a lot because of the IU students. Yeah. And if you look at where there are universities, those counties will be heavily collected. But you can just go one county outside and mm -hmm. right. they're missing a lot. Right. And that's and that's why uh, you know we're, my my effort is to try to get get it so we have a reasonably decent resolution to the county level. And so trying to get it so we we've, we've got a voucher whether it's photographic or a physical specimen from the various counties. So this is where if you do those observations on things that are readily identifiable, the photograph can serve as a, as a voucher. I wouldn't use that for grasses and <laughs> sedges and technical groups, you know, things with big obvious flowers or things that are, you know, like common, a common thing like dandelion, you could just use a, a photograph. Thank you all very much for, for joining us this evening. And thank you very much for presenting to us, Paul. This was really, um, really good. I liked your news flash at the top. That was, thank you. That was fun. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Thanks Thanks a lot. Paul. Interesting.